Welcome to a special edition of the program Realities and Perspective. We have today uh, as a special guest uh, someone from Ukraine, from Kiev, uh, Boris Volkov. Welcome, Boris, for the first time in our studio. Thank you, Tudor. Thank you. As I know, as you shared with us before taping this program, you are you represent Walk to the Bible in, in your area. So first of all, introduce yourself for the viewers who for sure they didn't know you, they didn't have the chance to see you. Yeah, my name is Boris Volkov and I'm a regional director of Walk Through the Bible in countries of Northern Eurasia. Uh, we, we, we call it Northern Eurasia just to define the countries which belong to uh, uh, the former Soviet Union. Our ministry pre is predominantly uh, taking place in Ukraine, but also in countries of uh, uh, Central Asia and, uh, you know, to, till the most recent uh, days in Russia. So we are taping this program, maybe some of our viewers will see the program later, a few days later. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what will be the situation tomorrow in Ukraine or not, but at least <clears throat> we want to encourage people to pray for the situation. But first of all, you are living in Ukraine. From how many years you are living in Ukraine? For? First of all, I need to mention that I am ethnically Russian. I was born in Russia and I was growing up in Siberia, so I would consider myself as a Siberian. But when I was 25, uh, we uh, moved uh, from Siberia to Ukraine because actually I, I married on a girl who was from Ukraine. And uh, among the, I would say, three of the most important decisions in my life was actually a decision to uh, move from Russia to Ukraine. And uh, I would uh, I want to really thank God for opportunity to absorb an atmosphere and the air of, uh, of freedom and fresh, uh, freshness of uh, thinking. Uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurship uh, mentality of Ukrainians, which I was capable to absorb into my background. Let's talk about Kiev, because uh, now everyone is, what's, what means Kiev? It's the capital of Ukraine, but it's more than. Of course, we are looking for spiritual perspective, historical perspective for the viewers who didn't know exactly about Kiev too much, only looking to the news in these days. Thanks for asking. Uh, you know, these days, many people uh, began to more clearly realize that there is country known as Ukraine, which is different than Russia. Because very often uh, in the past uh, days, uh, you know, when, you, when I was introducing myself, uh, I am from Kyiv, uh, many people were wondering, uh, is it uh, Russia or somewhere, or somewhere there? Now people definitely know that Ukraine is Ukraine and Kyiv is the capital of independent country. Uh, we are Ukrainians identifying uh, ourselves as a, uh, independent nations and uh, in this independency we, we, we stay even now in these uh, days of attack. But let's get back to Kyiv. Uh, even before uh, the most uh, populated uh, Russian-speaking city in the world, uh, Moscow, was established, Kyiv was already there where it is. Actually, uh, Slavic Christianity uh, has uh, its beginning in Kyiv. Uh, it, and it's not that far from the place where I lived uh, till recently. Uh, the place where uh, uh, Vladimir uh, the Great uh, was uh, firstly baptizing uh, pagans into Christianity. We don't know what was it, uh, what uh, that evangelistic event lo looked like, but actually that was the beginning of uh, Christianity in our part of the world. And in our uh, city, in Kiev, we have, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a Baptist, and uh, we are Baptist Baptists are not about, you know, talks uh, about uh, monasteries, monks, etc., etc. But talking about general Christian background, I would mention that there in Kiev, we have uh, one of the most important and notable monastery, which is called Lavra, Kiev Pichersk Lavra, which, which plays the most uh, important role for uh, Orthodox Christianity in, uh, in the part of the world. So uh, that is why I would say that just like for any Jew living either in New York or in uh, Bucharest or uh, in Timisoara or in Kiev, Jerusalem, Jerusalem plays a significant role because it is, a, it is Jerusalem. Uh, so probably the similar meaning has Kiev for that part of the world because it is a, a, a motherland 
of culture. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, for uh, Russians and for Putin, that was uh, absolutely important to declare that the motherland of our ethnicity and our culture is now reconnected with whole Russian world. So, uh, but let's so, get back. So Kiev is important because I was grew up <clears throat> as education in a communist time, mm -hmm. and we learn from our history, from our classroom, uh, about cities in, of course, Moscow, the central city, Sevastopol, Tbilisi, uh, Petersburg, or uh, Kiev. Kiev was one of the cities who was part of the the list of the city, Russian cities. We didn't know exactly about the spiritual meaning of and importance of. Kiev. Even now, many Romanians didn't know exactly, and many viewers, why it's so special with Kiev. So even uh, the army, maybe the army, the politicians didn't know too much about things. But Satan knows about this because I think this war uh, has a, also a spiritual significance. Maybe you can add something about this conflict from spiritual perspective. Um, yes. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, what is taking place right now in Ukraine, I would call uh, a genocide. But uh, this sort of genocide is targeted not on a, a certain ethnic group. Because uh, together, uh, all together with uh, Ukraine, which uh, uh, became a, uh, an independent country after collapse of uh, Soviet Union, uh, we inherited all different nations and groups inside our country. Azerbaijani people, Armenians, Georgians, Russians, Ukrainians, uh, Jews, Greeks, Romanians, of course, etc. Polish people. Po Polish people. Hungary, so, yes, yeah. so, do we consider Ukrainian ethnicity uh, as, uh, as something what Putin fights these days? No. That is why we are not talking about uh, particularly genocide. Because, for example, Kharkiv, which is uh, severely, harshly bombed these uh, very days, just ruining on our side, uh, it's predominantly, it's, it's mostly Russian-speaking and Russian people populated city in, uh, in the eastern part of the world. The city which was uh, usually voting for pro-Russian parties uh, in, for, for the past uh, decades. But what we are talking now, we are talking not about genocide particularly, but we are talking about spirit side. Let's, uh, let's create a, such a paradigm, yeah? Because uh, uh, when we talk about Ukrainians these days, we are talking about political nations. Because those who these days resist Russian aggression in Ukraine, no matter in Kharkiv or in Kyiv or in south of Ukraine, they have uh, either uh, some unique ethnicities like Greeks, Ukrainians, Russians, Kazakhs, Belarus, uh, Chechen people, etc. But they are all united by ethnicity uh, by political, uh, be belonging to political nation, belonging to political nation. And in my understanding, uh, uh, Satan, talking now in uh, terms of, uh, spir in spiritual terms, Satan hates the spirit of freedom. Satan hates the ability to mobilize yourself for different activities. You know, I, I just recently received a note from one of, uh, of the pastors in Russia who sent me a whole poem, uh, which is uh, about the war uh, these days. And there was a saying like, uh, you know, there is a saying in Ukraine, like a military greeting, uh, glory to Ukraine, uh, glory to heroes. Uh, and, uh, you know, that pastor sent me that poem and uh, there is a saying like, uh, all glory belongs to God and you were crying like glory to Ukraine. And I sent back to that pastor uh, a note. Uh, Do you think God that angry uh, to this same glory to Ukraine comparing to uh, other abilities of Ukraine, sending thousands of missionaries across the world? And you particularly one of those miss missionaries who was sent from Ukraine, supported from Ukraine. And I believe Satan hates ability of Christians in Ukraine to see overseas, to see beyond their borders, to, to grow churches within the country, uh, to plant churches across the world. So uh, it's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual war. And this is important. So people have to know who, who are watching us that Ukraine was like a spiritual base to reach uh, all the former Union territory and not, not only. Maybe you work with work to the Bible for many years, 20, 
plus years like them. So tell us about this, how God was using Ukraine as a platform to reach with the, uh, with the gospel, uh, the, the former uh, Union, uh, former uh, Soviet Union on other territories. Because people didn't know too much, especially in Romania, we didn't have information. <laughs> yeah. From my point of view, that, that looks like, that's obvious, uh, that's obvious. But I, I understand that, uh, you know, since we live in different contexts, we probably may be aware some, about some particularities. Like, for example, uh, Ukrainians, they, they do like uh, pork lard, uh, for example, uh, with chopped onions, etc. That's, or cook, cook borscht. That's not uh, everything about Ukrainians. That's why I thank you for asking this uh, question. So uh, Ukraine is geographically and mentally is located in, in between worlds. So we uh, absorbed uh, uh, Western uh, values to a certain extent. We um, are part of the bigger uh, uh, space, uh, living space for uh, many nations who were uh, uh, first uh, covered by Russian Empire and then by Soviet Union, etc. And uh, we inherited an ability to understand Russian language, to preach in Russian language. And that is why in, being in Ukraine, while staying in Ukraine, we were capable of uh, adapting different resources, for example, resources of works for the Bible for uh, needs of Russian churches, Russian Christianity, to help them to mature in God, to help them to uh, make spiritual impact, to make uh, good decisions, uh, what we generally say as a mission of uh, works for the Bible, helping people, people live God's word. And Russian language was actually uh, a very good tool which we inherited until the moment when the Russian uh, language began to be uh, uh, used by uh, Russian politicians as a, as a, a thug of war, tug of war, uh, you know, like a reason uh, to protect uh, Russian-speaking people. So Ukraine is geographically located in the right position. It is uh, mm, culturally located in the right uh, place. Uh, that is why uh, for us that was just a great uh, place. Uh, if our office would stay in Russia, uh, that would still work. But uh, you know, uh, the biggest uh, influence in the region, despite uh, the smaller size we have, not in Russia, but in Ukraine as ministry. But if I have a personal question, you are Russian, your wife is Ukrainian, so you serve the Lord uh, in the Kiev area. So what are you feeling? Again, we are taping this interview at the beginning of uh, March. Never know what will be tomorrow about the situation in Ukraine, if uh, we'll be happy with this interview or not. But how is your feeling? Uh, as a Russian, maybe people expect uh, to see you uh, on the Putin side, on the Russian side, on the Ukrainian side. Tell us about the feelings of the normal people being Russian or Ukrainian about this conflict. They, they agree with this or not? You have some encounter even with some Russians recently, and you told me that not everyone is happy with this conflict. Tell us about this. How you, how you feel um, in your heart uh, uh, being a Russian, native a Russian, having this conflict on your, uh, on your area? It is a very painful situation. It is a very painful situation. Uh, I believe that, uh, first of all, we... Uh, we, we all know uh, that uh, ultimate uh, enemy of every human being is Satan. No matter uh, who is this enemy, Ukrainian uh, or Georgian or Romanian man or Russian man. So I believe it's a uh, Satan uh, ap approach to literally kill people, to, uh, uh, to limit them in, a, uh, in ability to learn about God, learn about Christ, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, let's get back to your, to your question. So uh, why this situation is uh, painful for me? Uh, of course, uh, I, I received a note from my classmates. Uh, uh, when I felt that the war is about to begin, I sent to them, uh, do, you, do you support uh, this? Your uh, friends from Russia, I think. Uh, classmates. classmates. Uh, most of them, most of them live in Russia, live in Siberia. And I sent them uh, a note, do you think it's, uh, it's right? Would you agree it is right 
that was just a, a day before uh, the war erupted in Ukraine. And uh, there were some, some silly uh, pictures like uh, uh, raising flag of Russia over Ukrainian territory, uh, removing Ukraine, uh, some absolutely silly, silly stuff. Uh, and there was obvious expectation that we're going to come and make, make, and make you obedient because you are a disobedient uh, sister. We're going to come. We're going to punish you. But then you're going to leave. <sighs> when the situation began to change, their attitudes began to change as well. Now they are talking about they are not for war. And yet, uh, uh, attitudes of uh, around 50% of Russian populations, even these days, is supportive towards war. Uh, for, supportive for war, you understand? Yeah? Um, I've just uh, uh, heard about the most recent uh, uh, soci sociological research in Russia. Uh, and uh, the first question in that sociological research was uh, um, about uh, relationships between Ukraine and Russia. Do you think uh, we need to have peaceful relationships? And 88% uh, of Russians responded that yes, of course, 88%, that's a, quite an amount. But another question in the same research was, do you think uh, the military action is still necessary? And do you support those military actions in, uh, in Ukraine? Uh, and around 50% to different extent support this idea. This is still a horrible situation. It is still a horrible situation. And what's even more pity, more sad, that uh, some Christian still are not capable to define what is evil and what is not. As, as, as I have just mentioned, uh, a poem, you know, uh, you were crying glory to Ukraine and now God punish you. Come on. Guys, are you serious? Are you still not able to define what is obvious evil bombing our uh, civil, uh, civil objects, our hospitals, our maternity houses? Are you serious, guys? Um, it is a very painful situation. But I see that something is changing. Because uh, on the way here to this studio, I received a note from, uh, from a family I visited in uh, 2018, uh, just a few years ago. And uh, the lady sends me a note, Boris, forgive us. He's a Russian family. Russian family from Russia, from Siberia. Please forgive us. They're Christian. They're Christian. <sighs> I said, uh, God will forgive you. I, I mean, to a certain extent, it expresses my heart because, uh, um, you know, probably in this studio, I should, uh, I should uh, say something like, uh, let us pray for peace, let us peace, uh, pray for reconciliation. But uh, when you have just lost home, when you was, uh, when you was just uh, recording uh, the rooms where you lived, literally saying goodbye to your uh, home, sweet home, that, which was take, taken place just recently. Uh, I have, I can't say I have mixed feelings. It's more about hatred. I resisted. I desperately resisted. That's why I, I mentioned to, to I sent uh, to her, I know that God will forgive you. But, but on the other hand, I send you uh, to her, uh, another uh, message like, uh, you know, such a picture comes to my, my mind. Uh, rape happens. Rape is taking place right now. And uh, if we now talk about forgiveness from uh, the one uh, who was raped to the one who raped, then probably that would be good to stop rape right now and then talk about forgiveness. I am for forgiveness. I am for reconciliation, I tell you. But right now, it's not a rape. It's a genocide. It's a spirit side which is taking place in our country in 21st century. That's why, to be honest, 
I have a very mixed uh, feelings and you know if uh, I would chop this uh, pie of my feelings and do, uh, try to sort out which are uh, more negative, I would say that uh, a big part of my feelings are negative, are negative. You mentioned a few moments ago about uh, taping with your phone your house. I think literally it's happened a few days ago when you, lived, uh, when you, you decided to leave your house uh, near Kiev. Yes, uh, I took a key from uh, from the door to lock to lock the door at my house, and uh, I abruptly caught myself. It might be last day when I stay here or when I see my house. Uh, my family they moved already outside of Kiev, uh, and I decided to to, to shoot a video. Can we insert some some image from this? Okay, uh, or you can give us later after this taping. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, People want to know exactly how it looks uh, h- home uh, in uh, in Kiev area. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a military base. It's not a, a, a nazist uh, demonstration. Uh, uh, it's just normal house in Kiev suburb where peaceful, peaceful people uh, living next uh, to me, where I uh, evangelized uh, uh, my neighbor living next to me and uh, he is visiting or visited our church. Uh, that was normal life. But you still have a smile on your face, Boris. So uh, people recognize that you are the Christians because it's a hope even, you are, have a mixed feeling. It's a hope on your eyes and on, on your smile. What is keeping you uh, like this? And First of all, uh, I can be very, uh, highly spiritual, yeah, to say that uh, the spirit of God is leading me. Just recently I sent a note to my colleagues that walk through the Bible and uh, I shared my, my heart. Uh, when we, we were approaching to the uh, border between uh, Ukraine and Moldova, and there were just a few cars before us, before we leave Ukraine, my son uh, told to me, uh, said to me, uh, Dad, do you realize that uh, we are about to become refugees? Uh, My heart was breaking. (laughs) I'm smiling these days uh, and (laughs) maybe some some, uh, uh, pills helps me to, to be calm, but uh, almost every day I cry when I send to my family of that video which I was taking of our house uh, yesterday. I was crying. How, how the churches, because you are, came from the Baptist area, probably in this situation they don't care about what kind of Christians are. Protestant or Orthodox, how the Christian locally in Ukraine reacted or they, uh, some are refugees. Tell us about the spiritual atmosphere uh, in the body of Christ in Ukraine. We are mobilized. We are mobilized. Um, I re- I'm really glad that the uh, body of Christ in, uh, in Ukraine has great ability to mobilize its, uh, themselves. Uh, our Christians these days uh, help uh, provide necessary means for life uh, for our army, for civilians. Uh, and uh, before we started interview, interview, I had a talk with, our, with one of our pastors who is right now there in Kiev. And uh, I asked him, Sasha, where are you? What are you doing right now? And he says, I'm crossing these uh, checkpoints. I'm hiding to this uh, location because uh, their uh, Mennonite brothers, they have uh, collected and ready to provide some uh, foodstuffs. And uh, we uh, take those foodstuffs, food, uh, food packs and will uh, distribute it partially to our army, partially, partially to people who already are challenged with uh, food crisis because food crisis is uh, becoming is more, is more and more obvious uh, right now. So uh, our Christians, uh, they help people to, uh, in a spiritual way, in, uh, in shelters, uh, you understand, b- b- anti-bombing. 
uh, in shelters. Uh, our pastor, another pastor of our church, Lubomir, he lived together with other uh, people from his house uh, in a basement of the house uh, where he lives and uh, he brings light into the most uh, dark uh, situation uh, where he and his family, his two sons and uh, other people are. And uh, Christian remain to be Christians even there. And uh, you know, we know uh, such a saying that uh, in, when night is the most dark, uh, stars are the most bright. And we, have, we are called to be light in the darkness as Christians. Yes. So <clears throat> a few minutes talk, uh, that talk about the mission. Of course, uh, the, the war uh, affects your mission strategies. But you are connected with a lot of other uh, Walk to the Bible offices, even here in Romania. So tell us a, a few minutes beyond the war about your activity, your work, your role with Walk to the Bible, how you started, what we are doing about this. In a few minutes to summarize your, your ministry there as a, as a branch of Walk to the Bible. When we made it to Ukraine, uh, uh, to Moldova from Ukraine, I said to uh, myself, I said to my son and I called to my wife. Uh, she is in Hungary right now with our daughters and uh, I said, since God allowed us to be in a safe place, I just can't waste uh, the time and opportunities which, has, which God is about to open here because every crisis creates an opportunity as well. So that is why um, I began to, to, th to think in a way of uh, searching, searching of opportunity. So God, what opportunity you open to me right now? So, and uh, there are lots of thoughts uh, on my table and uh, these very days I am trying to uh, more or less structure it and to more clearly define uh, where and how should I be involved. And it's, uh, this process is not yet finalized, but uh, talking about walks through the Bible and the resources and the approaches which we have, we definitely my, uh, will have role for the people uh, who moved outside of Ukraine because you know these people uh, I'm talking I'm not talking about the body of Christ I am talking about uh, non-believers people are lost they and they uh, suffer from loneliness uh, in a crowded uh, places where they don't know each other and uh, my thought is that uh, that would be very good uh, uh, if uh, churches in uh, in Europe in Romania, in Hungary, in Poland, in G Germany, wherever our refugee run these very days, would open and would let our refugees, I am not talking about Christians, I am talking about refugees at all, to, uh, to uh, get different sort of support so that the churches could become as centers of support, either uh, food support or clothing support, and communication support. And uh, in my understanding, uh, we are about to see uh, how God will uh, create a new opportunity for those who flee uh, from Ukraine to find not only refuge, but also a salvation in countries where they were uh, forced to run. Um, I just recently uh, remembered about uh, one uh, seminar which, which was developed uh, at Vox for the Bible. It is by coincidence, just a couple of years ago was developed, uh, not for these events, of course, uh, uh, but uh, its name Refuge. And uh, it has uh, four, uh, four sessions. Uh, it is based on a book of uh, Ruth and uh, four sessions of uh, that uh, seminar is saying about lo losing of house, losing of hope, then finding home and finding faith. This is exactly what happened with, uh, with people uh, mentioned in the book of uh, Ruth. Uh, I 
just a couple of days ago, I, I sent a note to my colleagues that uh, I'm probably in a second section, a session of this about, uh, I'm, I lost my house already. Hopefully it uh, will survive and uh, one day we'll go back continue ministry at my house. But uh, at this point I lost it. I, every day I sleep in a new bed. Uh, uh, one night I spent in, in a car. Uh, many people spend more nights in car and uh, have no beds at all. Uh, but I also mentioned that uh, I am desperately resist thought that uh, I'm, I'm losing my hope because I preach to myself, Boris, you have a strong rock, uh, which is Jesus. Boris, you can't lose your hope. You know who is ultimate uh, hope. But uh, it is very difficult to resist such a feeling. And I understand that uh, these uh, days I might look like uh, many people to, to whom I looked in 2014 when uh, uh, first military actions uh, uh, were initiated by Russia in the eastern Ukraine and many people uh, flee, uh, flee from there. Uh, Maurice, I want to mention that uh, this project, Refugee, will be aired, this four episode in Alpha Omega Ministry uh, TV channel in a few mm -hmm. days. We are in process to translate it. So I Great. hope it will be, bring hope and understanding to our Romanians, at least, or the people who watch uh, our channel. So you mentioned about uh, uh, the opportunity. This, this situation will bring the opportunity to churches in Romania, in other countries in Europe, to not only to provide food, close or um, <clears throat> to host uh, refugees, but also to, to act, to, to spread the gospel. And also maybe some people from the States, from outside of the uh, continent will heard about this, this challenge that you have and will think differently about using the time, the resources that they have to put a seed in mm -hmm. any kind of projects that help bringing the gospel. So what do you think about the timing? People said, oh, we have another 50, 100 years. Other think it will be a, a time for the big harvest because, because before the second coming of, of Christ. But probably uh, doesn't matter about this perspective or other perspective, we have to use this chance to spread, uh, to spread the gospel. So let me know how People can help. Already you mentioned how churches, Christians, can help uh, uh, in Ukraine because the majority of the Romanian uh, of our viewers they want to send their uh, food or crossing the border with car with uh, medical supply. How people from all over the world can help uh, Ukrainian and the situation now, or how they can be involved? Uh, let me first say that uh, when you have Ukrainians here. Uh, you have good people. You have, I'm not talking about that other refugees are bad people, etc. But I mean that uh, Ukrainians are capable to enrich, to enrich your communities, to enrich your uh, life, your churches, enrich in spiritual way, uh, etc. So uh, that's why I would consider I would consider Ukrainians coming here as an opportunity for local churches, uh, uh, not just to serve but to understand that they can be enriched. Local churches, local congregations might be enriched, uh, may be enriched by Ukrainians coming here. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, to consider on such options like, um, please help Ukrainians keep their identity. Uh, I, I was thinking uh, where I want to send my uh, daughter to go to school. I have two daughters. Uh, and uh, where I want to send them to go to school, in Hungarian school, that would be a very big challenge for them because it's difficult language, quite opposite from a uh, Slavic group of languages. It's uh, maybe different study program, etc. But it is still an option. But what if, uh, what if uh, churches would allow the, uh, to use uh, their uh, spaces uh, like Base, basements, classes, etc., which are empty for most of the uh, time in, in the week, to to use for classes uh, for Ukrainians, because uh, uh, for online classes, for teachers to come and teach, that's that's a very uh, fresh and not structured thoughts at any way yet. Just you know. We were not prepared for uh, the uh, events uh, we are in the middle of. Uh, but to help Ukrainians to keep their identity, uh, keeping their identity would, uh, would not uh, uh, be a threat 
for churches, for community, for countries, etc. We see, you see, Ukrainians are for freedom, Ukrainians are for uh, unity, uh, Ukrainians for uh, values, uh, for family, etc. Uh, so one of the thoughts: keep Ukrainians, uh, keep their identity, help help them to continue to be Ukrainians in these uh, congregations, Romanian, Hungarian, Polish, etc. Uh, open your churches for as distribution centers on one hand uh, for refugees, uh, but also as um, schools, potentially schools. And I, I think uh, if uh, if the war will continue, we don't know what is taking happening in minds of uh, Putin and his elites. Uh, we, we, we need to react it not just in the way of uh, providing uh, foodstuffs. And honestly, uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate the, this emotional drive, uh, which this emotional push, which uh, helps uh, to mobilize uh, thousands of people uh, for donations, for food supplies, medications, etc. That's good. But uh, uh, I would challenge also, I would challenge to uh, think about uh, long distance, long distance. We, uh, we have an experience in Ukraine that, uh, you know, the topic of refugees uh, is important in, in the first uh, couple of months. But then people get tired. Uh, I would call uh, people to spiritually not to let these people, uh, not to let this uh, topic to disappear. Uh, I understand that, it's, that uh, it is a challenge for uh, nations, for communities, for churches, etc. It uh, takes resources, organizational, financial resources, etc. But uh, our God is rich. Yes, I hope uh, your testimony will challenge the people, not only from Europe, but even from outside of this continent, to think on a long term, long distance, because it's not a moment, not a uh, not a sensitive moment now about refugees. It's a something, a long-term project, I, I think, at least in God's eyes. What is, we don't want to close this program without having a short testimony from you. For example, I heard just before taping this uh, interview that you have gone through COVID and uh, um, you are here, safe. Tell us if you think about this experience and maybe uh, other experience, not only about your health, uh, how, how you see God as intervening in your life and the life of your friends. Yeah, uh, in 2020, uh, in 2020, uh, I was infected with COVID-19, and just like more, uh, most of the people, I was expecting that uh, that would be just, uh, you know, a flu. Uh, a flu, yeah, couple of days, and uh, and. But a few days later, I found myself in ICU, and even there, I was thinking that, you know, I am not the first in ICU, uh, so let's count one, two, three, four, five days, and I'm going to exit. Oh, that's okay. But a uh, few days later, I found myself totally uh, struggling for life, uh, struggling for breath. Uh, I can't breathe. Uh, and. Um, at a certain moment, I, uh, I said, Lord, if you decide to say enough for me, enough to live here and go home, I'm ready. I'm ready. And uh, at that moment, I, let's say, uh, got lost. And when I... Uh, came back, let's say, uh, when I again began to think, uh, I found uh, that uh, I can easier, a little bit easier breath. And uh, a few hours later, after I was uh, discovered that I am uh, breathing a little bit better, uh, I was told that I spent uh, around three days on a ventilator, uh, intubed. Uh, so I totally spent uh, 47 days in the hospital. Of them, uh, 30 days I spent in, in ICU. 
And of those 30 days, I spent all around three days uh, being connected uh, consciously as being connected uh, to artificial uh, ventilation of my lungs. It uh, affected my health. Um, it affected my health. And during uh, these days, uh, when the stress came, I uh, began to feel a shortage of, of breath. But nevertheless, God, God let me to continue life and to to be even here in Alpha Omega Studio. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, good to know that uh, God, God knows that you'll be here in this studio, so it's one of the reasons, I believe, that you are here among us. So how, uh, tell us maybe at the end about your wife. You didn't mention only about your family. How, when you saw her the last time and what was your goodbye uh, for a while uh, relation? If you want to share with us about this. What's the name of your wife? Uh, my, name, uh, my wife's name is Lila. Uh, we have two daughters uh, and one son. I have three children. Uh, when Putin announced that uh, he acknowledges uh, those uh, people republics in the eastern Ukraine, I realized almost immediately the war is about to begin. So, and uh, I realized that uh, Kyiv might be a subject for uh, some a ta a specific targets. Sp yeah, for spe specific targets. And since I knew that uh, some military uh, uh, points were not that far from my house, I made a decision to send them out of Kyiv, uh, and it happened uh, in the beginning of the uh, past, past week. So I put them in a car, and I said, go, I go. I said, I stay here. Uh, and uh, I didn't see, uh, I haven't seen him for uh, more than a week already. Uh, but honestly, I'm, I'm already lost uh, in days. Uh, there are so many you know, actions uh, that have taken place uh, in these uh, past days that I cannot uh, precisely say uh, how many days I haven't seen them. But we have hope that sometime your family will be reunited. So, uh, Boris, at the end of this discussion, of course, many people are praying for situation for ending the war, for protection, mm -hmm. for challenging the churches outside of Ukraine to, to react according to God's plan. I don't know how God will lead you to have a short prayer now at, at the end of our interview, or even say a few words as a challenge before, if you like. Because prayer is something. We, we as a Christian TV, we didn't uh, present too much war uh, aspects, but we challenge people to pray and to help to be involved? Of course, pray for peace. Pray for peace for, for Ukraine. For Ukraine. God is talking to us. God is talking to us. And what I see uh, in the crucible, from the crucible where we are uh, right now, uh, must appear a new nation. But the story may, might, be, uh, might be repeated, the story of war might be repeated if these new emerging nations will not absorb, integrate, incorporate in their lives as a values, those important values of freedom, of godliness, of family. That's why for, please pray for, uh, for us when we are in the process of transformation and transfiguration of our uh, nation so that we could melt together with the most important values. And so that uh, the church, the body of Christ, and I'm, I'm talking about uh, Ukrainian part of the body of Christ, 
and international body of Christ would make an input into the, this uh, melt. So that that would be a, a good combination which would, which would help us to resist, uh, resist uh, internal uh, rot, decay. Okay. Well, it's maybe I have a short prayer now and I ask, I challenge you to pray together with us to be in unity when we are from Romania, from Europe, from United States or all over the world, uh, uh, Romanian speaking, English speaking people to resonate, to be in unity with uh, uh, Boris' prayer now. Boris. Heavenly Father, uh, I thank you for opportunity to uh, be in this studio. I thank you for opportunity to uh, talk about the situation in Ukraine. I thank you for opportunity to share my heart. And I thank you for opportunity to call uh, people to certain actions. My Lord, uh, we call to you, we urge, we desperately need peace. Lord, uh, we need peace, but we don't want it at any cost. And when we pay this cost, please help us to integrate and incorporate into our new nation and new mentality right values. Be with us. Be with us. Be with our soldiers, with our officers. Be, be with our uh, president, with cabinet of ministers. Be with uh, uh, those territorial defense. Be with refugees. Be with internally displaced people. Lord, please uh, be and encourage uh, local churches, either in Ukraine or abroad, to be response to the needs of the people. Lord, help local churches, help body of Christ to find opportunities, to gain benefits, eternal benefits from uh, the situation which looks horrible and yet controlled by you. I ask it, I pray, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Boris, thank you for this time that you spent here with Alpha Omega in the Realities and Perspective program. And I pray that God will speak to our viewers about, uh, about what's happened from spiritual perspective, because this was a discussion about the conflict in Ukraine, but from spiritual perspective. May God bless you and guide you in the future uh, time, serving the Lord with what you have and what you are. May God bless you next time on the Reality and Perspective. May God bless you from the Alpha Omega TV studio. Thank you.